As the fruit and veg business recovers from the pandemic, other challenges have emerged. Cost inflation, energy shortages, the war in Ukraine and climate change. All of these pose a serious threat to its future success. Fruit Logistica's content program of talks and discussions offer helpful advice on how to tackle these and other major challenges. Just go to fruitlogistica.com and you can see the event program there. Now, among the many industry experts who will be in Berlin in February is Philippe Binard. Philippe is head of Freshfell Europe, the European Fresh Produce Association, and he is well placed to comment on these challenges and how they will affect the fresh produce sector in 2023. Let's hear from Philippe now. Philippe, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now, the past year, I guess, has been unlike any other for the fresh produce business. Uh, we've had a couple of years in which the pandemic created major short term difficulties for the industry. Uh, and now, as we emerge from the pandemic, it's faced with some other big challenges, the economic crisis uh, and a decrease in consumer spending power. Uh, an energy crisis fueled by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and significant pressure uh, all over the place to become more sustainable in the face of climate change. Um, it's a lot to think about. Do you think the fruit and veg business has what it takes to overcome what some are calling uh, an omni crisis? Well, if you look historically, it's not only the last two, three years that with the COVID, I think the major first crisis, they were the egg, but then there have been the Russian embargo. There have been a number of other things. Brexit as well, which was raising many questions. And then we had indeed an accumulation and, and of crises which have been proliferating. COVID, post-COVID, the climatic crisis, the energy crisis, the, the, the concern about consumer. I think in all these crises, the sector have show a great level of resilience. I think we have been there. There have been no shortage in the supermarket. The sector has been there responding. I think now what is happening, I think it's quite unprecedented what is happening because we combine now uh, the things for each of these crises. You need to adapt yourself. You need to make new investment to respond to the, the changing market. And I think now we are combining this with the rising costs of energy, the, all the other elements, not only energy, it's packaging, it's uh, logistic, which has been increasing. So the question is whether the, the sector has the capacity to overcome that and still deliver what it has to be delivering, because it's an essential sector, which is also part of the solution to the Green Deal, the Farm to Fork, which are also requiring a lot of energy. Mm. Now, one of the solutions I remember when Russia closed as a market, the Europe's fresh produce business looked to overcome that crisis by expanding into Asia. But now the development of overseas exports seems a much more challenging prospect. So how can EU produce exporters continue to grow their share of those markets which are further away? Is that still possible? Well, everything is possible, but we have to understand that we are I think today in a process of deglobalization, I think that's uh, something that maybe is relatively new. Uh, I think with the farm to fork, we have been used more and with COVID as well to be more consuming local product. But I think we have to look as a sector at uh, all the, the different market opportunity on the fresh market, on the process market, on the domestic market, intra-EU market, which is a kind of safe bank, and we cannot ignore the market outside as a buffer um, for the, the stability of the market. We should not forget that 95% of the consumer are outside the European Union. So I think we have to look. What we have to learn from the Russian embargo is the issue of dependency. We cannot uh, depend so much from one market which was representing 2 million tons. But after the Russian embargo, there have been a crisis in Algeria, there have been a crisis in uh, in Belarus. Uh, there is now the issue with Ukraine and what it represents in terms of logistics for when you want to go to Kazakhstan or to Mongolia. So I think the situation is different. Of course, when looking at the uh, market in Asia, in Latin America, imply good control of logistics, the right product for this market. But uh, also, uh, I think it's quite important that we can 
address all the SPS country because there are a lot of country which are uh, very keen to export to Europe, but which sometimes forget when they want to import product from Europe to stick to the SPS uh, legislation, to the trade facilitation agreement, which require speedy negotiation, which require uh, non-costly procedure, which require transparency and sometimes it is not respected. So the process will go on. There are still a lot of effort made to be present uh, worldwide. We have a lot to offer from the EU and uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, there will still be a significant volume, including to the UK, because don't forget that the UK is now part of the EU export. Mm. It's, now, it's now a, a third country, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned Ukraine, and of course, um, I should really ask you about Ukraine. It's more or less one year uh, since Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, and obviously there was background to that with its previous invasion of Crimea. That had a big impact on the EU fresh produce business. Um, what do you see happening in the next year or two? How, how do we overcome that particular um, difficulty? Well, in, in, in terms of export to Ukraine, I think the volume were relatively limited. We have seen, mm. though, uh, maybe as a food aid, that there have been some additional volume. But we have to look at the, the, the bigger picture. I think um, Ukraine and all the region there was representing the import of 7 million tons of product, uh, including uh, what was going to Russia, to Kazakhstan. So I think we are in a situation where there is a lot of repositioning which is needed. And uh, this is a, a process which is not impacting only on the EU, it's impacting maybe Southern Hemisphere country, it's impacting uh, other country in the EU neighborhood, Moldova, uh, Serbia, uh, which were also delivering there. So I think there is a, a new distribution of cards, uh, which will be quite important to be observed what will be the effective impact. In Europe, we were also concerned possibly about rerouting process, which has not really uh, happened so far. So I think everyone is taking its own responsibility to find the solution to this very awkward and inimaginable uh, situation. Mm. Now, Philippe, you mentioned sustainability as well. One of the big headaches for fruit and vegetable suppliers right now seems to be this need to become environmentally sustainable in the longer term but without sacrificing the short-term economic viability of their companies. So what can suppliers do to achieve both of those goals, if possible? And you, in many cases, it can be very difficult to be sustainable and profitable at the same time, no? But I, I think partially your question is, uh, is leading me into my answer, because when you talk about sustainability, there are three pillars, the economic, the environmental and the social. So I think it's to find the right balance. I think from the environmental uh, sustainability, the fresh produce sector has been probably one of the pioneer sectors. You remember 20 years ago what was happening with the, uh, the global gap or the Europe gap uh, certification, which was pushing the sector into additional uh, requirements based on, on an already relatively strict EU legislation. So I think we are already in the journey of environmental sustainability. What we still have to do is improve our accountability. In Freshfield, we have started an environmental footprint process because it's important to be accountable and transparent so that uh, there is no, uh, that, so that there is a level playing field between everyone to demonstrate what we can do. We are good in water uh, uh, footprint. We are good in, uh, in pesticide uh, footprint. We are good in, in all the records. And I think this, this is quite important that uh, we, we continue the journey, but the journey will still probably require some investment. And I think we have to be concerned that today we have uh, still a lot of pressure with the rising cost. And, and maybe some irrealistic targets of the of the of the agenda of the farm to four. So mm. how can we reach the, the the green deal objective if we have red figures on the account of the company? So I think that's indeed a, a difficult balance. But definitely, uh, the sector will look for solution, and I'm sure we'll achieve it because we have the right product. We are an essential product, and we are part of the solution. Mm. Now. You said it is a difficult balance. One of the kind of pressure points for the industry at the moment uh, is packaging. It's it's an area where the concept of economic and environmental 
uh, goodness or sustainability seem to be contradicting each other. You look at France, France is doing away with single use packaging um, and, and that ban is um, arguably leading to more food waste and, 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 and not solving the problem. I know that's what some of your members feel. How, how do you view that situation? Well, first of all, I think the, what is happening in packaging is a major danger for the functioning of the single market. If you have each of the country which set their own rules, their own target, their own labels for demonstrating that you are compliant with the, the requirements on uh, reuse, recycle, I, I think that's one big issue. And, and of course, behind that, there is a question of cost, because if you have to be managing stock for different markets, without knowing always where is the final destination of the product. So I think it is creating a lot of things. I think if you look what has been happening in France, the, the French legislation has been challenged. And I think it's a, a witness that probably our sector has been again taken as being the, the test product to, to, to move faster than other. I think we were supposed to phase out plastic by 2026 when other sector could continue up to 2040. So why targeting so much on fruit and vegetable always? And as you say, I think on the packaging, of course, it's a, it's a mean of transportation of the product, but it's a mean also to avoid food waste. It's a yeah. way to secure food safety, to avoid microbiological contamination. It's a way of maintaining the quality of the product. So I think there are a lot of things behind the packaging idea. We don't pack the product because we want to do that. And I think also for the convenience of the consumer and what will be the impact if everything has to be sold loose. I think that will change completely the, eat, the, the purchasing habit. And I think that will be very detrimental for the sector. So what mm -hmm. we need to do now is to secure that the European legislation will apply in a similar manner. So we need one legislation for one Europe. Mm. OK, now we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, we talk with moving nicely on to consumers now and, and that idea of value and, um, you know, the cost of the product, uh, the cost that's spent on packaging creates value in many, many cases for fruit and vegetables. Um, but this cost of living crisis is having a big impact in Europe's consumer markets. And some would argue that the perceived value of fresh produce is under more threat than ever before. Um, why do you think that's happening? And, and what do you think needs to change that devaluation? Well, uh, first of all, I think packaging is a way to create value, to make uh, differentiation compared to our real competitor, which are not the next neighbor in the fruit sector, which is the agro-food sector, which is used to heavy branding, heavy marketing possibility. I think if we don't have the packaging to value the product and, and to also claim what we, have, what we have in terms of health benefit, in terms of environmental benefit, I think the, the policy has to be coherent. We cannot uh, uh, say that we will have this uh, uh, health label uh, nutritional label, uh, which will be to classify an agro-food product as A. All the mm. A products are the fruit and vegetable sector. So I think we have to do that. But I think your question was much broader like this. So definitely we have a lot of pressure in the sector, but we have also to understand that the consumer have also their purchasing power being affected. And, and there we have maybe a question of uh, image that we need to address. I think Fruit and vegetable are unfairly perceived as being expensive. They are not expensive. You can compare with any other kind of food. We are much cheaper than any other uh, product. And on top of that, we have a fantastic health benefit. Don't forget mm. that the cost of uh, eating habits, uh, for one euro you spend on food in Europe, you need two euro to rectify the cost of unhealthy eating habit. If you say in the broad picture, the, the food market in Europe is about three trillion euro. So that means that we spend probably six trillion euro in social security uh, to recover the consequence of the um, uh, unhealthy eating habit. So we need to position our product 
convince the consumer that in time of crisis, it's good to maintain a healthy diet and to make sure that uh, they understand that uh, eating a healthy diet is something which does not cost that much. I think you can make your five serving uh, a day by with less than two euro. Mm. That's an incredible imbalance between the amount spent on fruit and vegetables or, or sorry on food and on, um, on on healthcare to rectify that problem as you say so the final question how can fruit and vegetable marketers do more to convince consumers of the demand uh, the, convince consumers that they should be eating healthier fruit and vegetables I think first we need to convince our politician that once they have strategy like the farm to fork, which is to move to an healthy diet, like the EU beating cancer plan, which is giving a, a good role for the prevention, that these concrete uh, uh, strategy are accompanied by the right policy environment. They, and there could be a lot of things that can be done. In the sector, I think we need to continue adapting the offer to the taste, evolving taste of different category of consumer. We have the youngest, we have the millennials, we have the elder, uh, we have the vegan, we have the, 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 the flexitarian. So I think there is not one category of consumer and we have differences across the European Union as well. So I think we have to adapt to that. We have to continue to make promotion and we do much less promotion than our competitor in the other food sector. And I think we can be reassured that uh, we have really a product which uh, really is convenient. Uh, it's uh, tasty, it's healthy. And uh, I, I think we just need to pass on the consumer so that the consumer who is aware that it is good is converting this awareness into a concrete action. There's a, a lot to do, uh, a lot to think about, but uh, a lot of potential, as you say. So um, we wish you and your colleagues uh, every success. And uh, thank you for speaking to us today, Philippe. And, uh, and thank you very much for inviting Freshfell to be part of this uh, preview of uh, Food Logistica. You're very welcome. We look forward to seeing you in Berlin, Philippe. Take care. Thank you. Interesting stuff, I'm sure you'll agree. Now, that's all we have time for on this episode of FruitNet's World of Fresh Ideas. Remember, you can go to Fruit Logistica's YouTube channel and watch all the other episodes there and subscribe to. And head to fruitnet.com where you can sign up for our free daily news email. We look forward to seeing you in Berlin for Fruit Logistica.